Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Holly Estrada Mexner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canada Arizona Business Council. I am thrilled to MC today's event. We are hosting it in partnership with the province of Ontario and Comse in Mexico City. But first, I want to remind everyone that for this webinar, all attendees will be muted. If you have a question for the panelists, please submit it to me using the Q&A function, and we will do our best to get it to our speakers. Today, we have the unique opportunity to discuss the future of the semiconductor industry in North America. We have speakers from Canada, Mexico, and the United States to talk about the current state of this industry. Arizona is moving full speed ahead with companies like Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company and one of our favorite longtime residents, Intel. We're also delighted that Sunlit Chemical, the first semiconductor industry supplier in the Valley, announced plans for a location in North Phoenix next to TSMC. This plant represents a $100 million capital investment into Arizona. You will hear how Canada and the province of Ontario are expanding their reach into this industry and what an enormous potential there is for our partnership with Mexico. Aside from incredibly competitive wages, Mexico offers not only raw materials like silica sand, but a chance to put a significant dent in supply chain disruption. The median inventory for consumers has fallen from 40 days in 2019 to less than five days in 2021. Now this is a generalization and the inventories are even smaller in key industries. And as we've learned the hard way in North America, a disruption overseas that shuts down a plant for two to three weeks has the potential to disable a manufacturing facility if it only has three to five days of inventory. So imagine not having to wait for these products to be moved overseas. But before we dive in too deeply, let me introduce a couple people with additional opening remarks. First, we have Glenn Williamson, the founder and CEO of the Canada Arizona Business Council, who will also be our moderator for today's panel. Glenn, thank you for moderating today. Not a problem, Holly. I just wanted to add a couple of comments on the front end of this. Uh, timing is everything, and this subject matter is right on cue. I don't know if everybody paid attention. Uh, the EU is announcing a $49 billion uh, forward-looking microchip uh, project that they are now very, very interested in trying to see if they can deal with some of the, uh, uh, the pent-up demand that is coming. And I wanted to bring that up because of what you talked about, Holly, with what is going on in Taiwan, what is going on in the supply chain around the, around the world. You're looking at an industry in $600 billion range, making about a trillion dollar of a trillion chips. So what is going on and why is this happening? Recently, I was fortunate enough to be with the leadership of Samsung. And a couple of the things that came up was the massive, massive increased use of consumer electronics, laptops and cell phones during the pandemic that has made and created a 10% increase in a consumer electronics business, where it normally would be 3%. This is putting pressure on a already stressed fab plant business for semiconductors, and therefore the downside of the supply chain. So we are literally watching this ecosystem change and adapt very, very quickly globally. And Europe making this move in the last 24 hours is an addition to what's going on in Japan, now gives America another opportunity. And when I say America, I mean North America. And the blending of Canada's massive R&D and supply chain capacity, along with what is going on with the redistribution of fab plants in America, and Mexico's opportunity to step to the plate, just like we've done with oil, energy, and automotive, this is now irony of ironies, probably one of the next key industries controlled by a very, very small group of people, which makes it fascinating from a global economic point of view. So I look forward to hearing our, uh, our panel. I look forward to hearing the minister and I'll turn it back to you, Holly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. Next, I'm happy to introduce Victor Andre Jamas, who is a director with Comse, which is the Mexican Business Council for Foreign Trade, Investment and Technology. Victor, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Holly, and uh, I greet 
Glenn and, and the rest of my friends here at this meeting. It's super exciting to see Mexico, Canada, and of course, uh, uh, the US partners that we have uh, also present be working hand in hand with other private sector officials and public sector leaders to consolidate our regional value chains. Uh, us at Comse, we are the Mexican uh, Council for Foreign Trade, Investments and Technology. We, we represent over 2000 international companies investing in Mexico or exporting from Mexico. And we have a presence in the 32 states in the country. This allows us to have a network through which we can help companies best export their products, but also to translate what it means to invest in Mexico for international businesses that are interested in coming to, to, to relocate their supply chains through ally shoring investment strategies. And the four points that we're seeing most important in these strategies are the following. The first is that relocating our, our supply chains to a North American uh, strategy or through a North American lens will augment our regional competitiveness, will also help us promote and attract new investments through strategic sectors like the semiconductor industry, and it will reduce vulnerabilities that were shown over the past th two years through the COVID-19 pandemic. The second is that we are coordinating with uh, our federal governments through the North American Leader Summit and the high level economic dialogue between the US and Mexico to find ways through which we can facilitate investments in key and strategic uh, industries, such as medical devices, pharmaceutical manufacturing, critical minerals, electric vehicle manufacturing, large capacity batteries, and semiconductors, of course. The third is that semiconductors right now are a uh, important issue, not just for the production of products such as iPhones and, and, uh, and, and Ford uh, cars, but also for national security purposes. And uh, we are seeing right now through the passage of the Uyghur Act, Uyghur Forced Labor Act in the United States, that uh, companies are being forced to relocate their supply chains, not because of the issues that we have touched on before, but also because of unfair practices that we're seeing in markets like China. And that opens a door for companies to source their materials from uh, a country like Mexico that has similar regulatory practices to the United States and has the USMCA commitment aspect in the relationship that permits the, uh, the, the relationship to be stable and also uh, with a long-term uh, commitment. And finally, the talent development that is available in Mexico can complement the talent shortages that we may be seeing in Canada and the US. And Mexico has large uh, numbers of engineers capable to develop different technologies, to participate in R&D capacities and for ne networking and startups. And that industry is very nascent. And we are excited to partner with countries like Canada to help us develop our talent base in order to best provide that talented uh, youth base for our, our partners, uh, our partner companies in the region. Thank you for the invitation and uh, looking forward to this discussion. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, the minister is actually having a little trouble with his link. Glenn, I know you had some more information that you wanted to share uh, before the panel got going. So if you wouldn't mind doing that now, and um, we will give the minister another minute to get logged in. Absolutely, not a, not a problem. I, um, I wanted to get back to a couple of the rationales that we're starting to see from, um, from a high level point of view. And Brian, um, you're, you're probably seeing a lot of this as well. The, you know, this, this shift from certain existing locations globally from a semiconductor point of view and what's driving that as I indicated in the first part. We believe that this is going to be something of massive significance for North America. And I'm hopeful that uh, as the minister is now coming on board, we can hear the Canadians thought on how this redistribution of semiconductor industry, what they feel is going to be, you know, going to be the next level for us in North America. That's the same way that uh, Victor talked about in Comse and going through this too. So minister, I'm glad to see you. 
Sorry, we had some difficulties getting on. Apologies all around. Great to see all of you, though. Great. I think I think we're set, right, Holly? Uh, yes, uh, Chelsea. If uh, you want to go ahead and, and give a formal introduction. Perfect. Yes, of course. Thank you, Holly. Um, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you to all of our friends across North North America for joining us today. Um, as Holly mentioned, my name is Chelsea Pete. I'm the Consul and Senior Economic Officer representing the Government of Ontario and leading our Trade and Investment Office in California, which covers the broader Western US, including the great state of Arizona. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all and a special shout out to the Canada Arizona Business Council, Comse, our Ontario offices in San Francisco and Mexico City, um, for all of their work in putting this event together today, a collaboration which represents uh, wonderful champions of the North American partnership. As just a little bit of background, our office is part of a network of 16 trade and investment offices in different markets around the world. We report to the Government of Ontario's Ministry of economic development, job creation, and trade, and we're responsible for supporting Ontario's business interests abroad. In all of our office locations, we're very fortunate to be co-located with Canadian consulates and embassies, and we work free and confidentially to be on-the-ground resources for those seeking to establish business expansion deals, new investments, and connections in Ontario, Canada. We hope you'll connect with us following the event to engage further, but in the meantime, I'm pleased to be here with you this morning to hear from our wonderful group of speakers, including a panel of experts on the future of North America's semiconductor industry. This is an industry that has received a lot of attention in recent months and, from good, and for good reason. Um, from a recent FDI session that our team participated in, we actually learned that capital investment in the semiconductor industry was up 282% in 2021 and uh, an increase of 345% in job creation. And that is a lot of opportunity. Um, Ontario has a robust innovation ecosystem in place which supports this industry. And there have been a number of exciting developments that you'll hear from shortly from our very own Minister Fideli. This sector is an important um, sector which exemplifies the strength, importance, and enduring relationship between Canada, the US, and Mexico. And with the USMCA in place, it's such an important moment to be talking about the, the benefits to all of our respective economies. So to speak more on Ontario's semiconductor industry and the importance of the USMCA, it's my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker. The Honorable Victor Fideli is a lifelong entrepreneur successful business person and philanthropist, and he has served as the Government of Ontario's Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade since June of 2019. A fellow proud Northerner like myself, Minister Fideli has served as the Member of Provincial Parliament representing Nipissing, Ontario since 2011, and prior to that he served two terms as the Mayor of North Bay. He has extensive business experience, having led his firm, Fideli Corporation, to be ranked 34th in the top 50 best places to work in Canada, and he's a true champion of the business community, which he continues to demonstrate in his current role. So without further ado, it's my, very, it's my sincere pleasure to turn it over to Minister Vic Fideli, Ontario's Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Minister. Thank you very much, Chelsea. It's great to see you again, by the way. Uh, I wanna say uh, what a, a, a thank you for that very warm uh, introduction. Um, and, and I also want to uh, bring greetings to everybody from Ontario uh, and just acknowledge uh, uh, our companies who are joining as pa uh, panelists, uh, uh, Venture Lab and uh, Senmina. And I wanna say, uh, Glenn, uh, thank you very much and Holly, uh, and everyone at the Canada uh, Arizona Business Council for today's event. This is uh, a really great uh, opportunity to uh, be able to speak with all of you. I wanna say uh, thank you to our friends at uh, uh, COMC as well, uh, the Arizona Commerce Authority, as well as uh, our offices in Mexico and uh, San Francisco. And it's really wonderful to see everybody again. And this conversation, as Chelsea said, is very, very timely. Um, with the global pandemic continuing to impact economies around the world, international cooperation and collaboration continue to be vital, both in helping put an end to COVID-19 and to support good jobs and a better future for our families and all of our communities. Not only has COVID-19 dramatically transformed the way we work, the way we live, and the way we do business, 
but it's really accelerated the disruption and innovation globally in how we prevent, detect, and treat disease, and how we deliver high quality, sustainable healthcare goods and services to our citizens from telemedicine to AI and data-driven drug discovery, Ontario companies are competing in a global transformation really accelerated by COVID-19, where success is determined by innovation, access to data, and the ability to raise capital quickly. So while the pandemic has led to incredible uh, innovations, it has also exposed gaps in our supply chains, and it's really shifted our priorities. Much of Ontario's focus over the last 18 months has been on reshoring PPE and other critical supply chains to protect the health and safety of our citizens while strengthening our economy and future pandemic preparedness. We've invested over a hundred million Canadian dollars to help our manufacturers pivot and deliver healthcare solutions and hundreds of millions more in digital health solutions, pure and applied research and strengthening our innovation ecosystem. Last spring, we introduced Ontario's first digital and data strategy. It was called Building a Digital Ontario, which brings the province one step closer to becoming a world leading digital jurisdiction. For your own information, we called it digital first, but it's not digital only but we've attracted over a billion dollars in investments from global pharmaceutical giants to advance uh, mRNA technology and produce new treatments, new medicines, vaccines to improve our domestic resilience. This includes recent investments by Roche, Sanofi, Resilience and 3M. Of course, the importance of an integrated North American supply chain is not lost on Ontario. Working together, we're stronger, more resilient. And that's why we continue to be relentless in our efforts to strengthen trade relations with all of our friends in the US and Mexico. And the strength of our relationship cannot be overstated. Canada and the US enjoy an almost unparalleled history of economic partnership formalized by the 1965 Auto Pact, followed by the 1988 Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and then cementing the linkages across North America, including Mexico with NAFTA. During this long period, our three countries supply chains have become increasingly integrated and our countries reaffirmed this joint commitment to tr that trade relationship by signing what we will call today USMCA. I like to call it NAFTA 2.0. We did that in 2018. It's something we're all proud of and we're committed to growing. And at a subnational level, this is where we see the rubber hit the road. Ontario is the number one customer of 19 US states. We're the third largest export destination for Arizona. And our province accounts for 53% of the total merchandise trade between Canada and the US. Similarly significant, Mexico was the third largest import source for Ontario in 2020 and the fifth largest destination for Ontario's exports from our province. Ontario continues working directly with US states and encouraging uh, a number of Mexican states to strengthen our economic ties. As an example of how we're doubling down on the progress we're made uh, working together at the subnational level, we're looking to build on the success of our then first of a kind strategic investment and procurement agreement, we call it a SIPA, with Maryland, and we signed that in 2020. This is a subnational agreement that is focused on boosting collaboration in areas including automotive, advanced manufacturing, and government procurement. So we're also working on a joint feasibility study with Michigan on new modes of autonomous and electric transportation. This joint effort will promote cross-border collaboration and advance North American leadership in this forward-thinking industry. So of course, events like this are another example of how we continue to promote and encourage greater economic ties between our jurisdictions. So as we enter our third year confronting this pandemic, yes, our third year confronting the pandemic, it has become crystal clear 
that without innovation and collaboration, the world would look very different than it does today. Our government understands that increased trade, investment, and innovation between Ontario, the US, and Mexico means improved pandemic preparedness, a more resilient economy, and better health care, services, and goods for all of our citizens. One of the industries that has come increasingly into focus is what powers a lot of our innovations. So what do our extensive technology intensive industry supply chains have in common? What we're here to talk about, semiconductors. Semiconductors are quite literally all around us. They're in everything from our modern conveniences such as cell phones and computers to refrigerators and dishwashers. They're how our cars start and how one day our vehicles could drive autonomously. They're how our airplanes navigate and land safely. It's how our transport trucks get just in time delivery to where they need to go. And this brings us to the story of Ontario's microelectronics sector where innovators and makers of electronic circuits, microchips and semiconductors continue to drive huge advances in virtually every technology product and application. Semiconductors are the key to how our microbiology labs scan thousands of COVID-19 test results and genome sequences so quickly. They help us manage the pandemic. They're helping our scientists to invent the future of diagnostic imaging, medicines, and vaccines. And they're the linchpin that will enable us to continue to grow our life science, our auto, clean tech, advanced manufacturing, critical minerals, and our aerospace sectors, just to name a few. This is an industry that thrives on innovation and innovation thrives in Ontario. Now, Ontario is ready to lead when it comes to advancing disruptive technologies that will drive advances in the semiconductor industry and supply chains, bringing some key elements of this crucial industry a little closer to home. It's collaborative, it's fueled by talented, passionate people. It's the kind of innovation, quite frankly, that we do best. For example, Ontario is home to Venture Lab's Hardware Catalyst Initiative. That's Canada's only hardware and semiconductor focused lab and incubator. I know Matt's gonna speak more on that today, but Venture Lab is an exciting initiative that helps companies building new technologies and transformative sectors like AI, auto tech, med tech, clean tech and beyond to accelerate their time to market in a sector that normally requires more time to test and scale. The hardware catalyst enables the creation of transformative technologies that will power the products of tomorrow. And it helps Canadians access resources and products needed to stay globally competitive and maintain operations here in North America. As Canada's leading hub, uh, hardware hub, it boasts more than 35 global partners and enables smaller ventures to become competitive players in the global semiconductor industry. But that's not all. Venture Lab is just one part of a network of the Ontario Regional Innovation Centers, our RICs, that we have created to help promote innovation and commercialization through regional, cross-sector, and industry collaboration. Ontario is also home to the national headquarters of the Canadian Semiconductor Council. The CSC is an independent, industry-led coalition led by globally recognized Canadian founders, business leaders, chip manufacturers, and investors. Their mission is to lead a national semiconductor strategy and action plan that positions Canada to be a global developer, manufacturer, and supplier of semiconductor products that are embedded in electric vehicles, medical devices, consumer electronics, and precision agriculture. The CSC is also leading the Roadmap to 2050, Canada's Semiconductor Action Plan. Now, this plan lays out short, medium, and long-term recommendations to build Canada's and Ontario's semiconductor industry. Ontario's innovation ecosystem is remarkable, and we continue uh, to take action to make it stronger. So let's start with our talent. In Ontario, 44 universities and colleges produce over 55,000 STEM graduates, science, technology, engineering, and math every year. We have world-renowned expertise in pure and applied research. 
our universities are doubling down in areas that support a robust semiconductor ecosystem as well. This can be seen in places like the University of Ottawa's Centre for Research and Photonics, Carleton University's Microelectronics Fabrication Laboratory, and Queen's University's participation in the National Design Network, just to name a couple of them. We have some of the highest R&D in Canada. 51% of Canadian life sciences R&D spending happens here, right here in Ontario. Our 24 academic research hospitals have invested as much as 1.4 billion in R&D, and they employ 18,000 researchers and staff and research staff right across the province. And incidentally, the vast majority of Canadian auto and EV R&D also happens right here in Ontario. I want to tell you a little bit about Ontario having the most competitive business climate in North America. We've been lowering taxes, reducing electricity costs, cutting red tape, making it easier for businesses to invest in skills and training, scale with new technologies, and improve global competitiveness. Businesses can benefit from a competitive manufacturing tax rate of 25%, and they have access to research and services from world-renowned Ontario research institutions, including the Mike and Ophelia Lazaridis Quantum Nano Center at the University of Waterloo, the Center for Emerging, Emerging Device Technologies at McMaster University, and others. We've been rolling out the welcome mat for companies interested in working in Ontario. We have our network of international trade and investment offices. You've met Chelsea earlier. They raise Ontario's profile and build commercial relationships in key markets around the world, including the US and Mexico. And that's where you've met uh, Shannon earlier as well. We also have a new investment attraction agency, Invest Ontario, that provides customized tools and services for companies that want to set up in our province. But that's not all. Ontario is investing heavily to diversify our innovation ecosystem. For example, let's talk about the auto sector, which is incredibly tied to the semiconductor industry. Ontario is the second largest producer of vehicles in all of North America. And we know that the future of auto is electric and autonomous. And that's why two months ago, we launched Driving Prosperity 2.0. It's the future of Ontario auto sector. This is a follow-up to phase one, which we announced in February of 2019, and that focused on the creation of a competitive business climate, innovation and talent. I spoke about the business climate, the change earlier, and all of those reductions and costs. By the way, that is a $7 billion annual lower cost today than when uh, uh, we began this venture of uh, uh, phase one of driving prosperity. So now in phase two, we're focusing on accelerating the production and growth in Ontario supply chains for electric vehicles and connected on autonomous vehicles and battery manufacturing. Phase two will allow our province to leverage our critical mineral wealth in Ontario's north, supporting a broader supply chain that includes mining and refining the minerals required for EV batteries. And that means good jobs for skilled workers all across Ontario, more opportunities to partner, collaborate, and increase trade across our borders. We're really excited to build on the success of Driving Prosperity One, which helped attract a truly remarkable run of transformative investments in Ontario's auto industry, almost $6 billion announced last year. And that includes over $4 billion for EV manufacturing. Ontario's future-oriented automotive cluster and industry supply chain is exhaustive and technology intensive. So lastly, I want to talk about Ontario's robust network of innovative companies that are at the forefront of innovation in microelectronics and semiconductor technology. Companies like Semina that I mentioned earlier, Celestica, TSMC, AMD, uh, ON Semiconductor, and others who are joining us here today. Like so much of Ontario's innovation ecosystem, these companies are built 
on a model of collaboration. It's our greatest strength in Ontario. Our people are always pushing to do things better. Collaboration is in their DNA and their ambitions are as global as the industries themselves. We know the future is digital and collaborative. There are many, many ways for Ontario, Arizona, and Mexico to work together to our mutual advantage. And we'd be delighted to work with you to help make that happen. So I'm gonna encourage you to reach out to Chelsea in our San Francisco office, Shannon in our Mexico office, and our esteemed panelists who are joining us today to explore those opportunities. Ontario is ready to compete. We're ready to collaborate. And you're going to hear it many times. Ontario is open for business. So thanks, everybody. Minister, you are the right individual for the job. Uh, that, that was as beautiful a pitch I've heard for Ontario and all the wonderful things that go on in Ontario. One of the things that you did bring up that I really wanted to elaborate on is mining. I think that is uh, I'm very, before we jump into the panel, Holly, I'm just going to, Minister, I'd like to ask you about that. And I know we're talking about semiconductors, but this has to do with a broader issue of EVs and semiconductors bleeds into that. If you could just push a little bit on the mining discussion. I'd be delighted to. Look, I live in Northern Ontario. Chelsea's going to love this because, you know, <laughs> this is how we roll in the North. Um, what, what is really fascinating, again, I'm just going to sort of tie three things together. Uh, I, I promise I won't take long, but we, when we did Driving Prosperity One, it was really focused on reducing the cost of doing business in Ontario. And we have by $7 billion a year. That got Ford, GM, uh, Stellantis, and others to make $6 billion in commitments to electric vehicles. And that opened the whole door. We have cobalt in Ontario. So it's about an hour north of where I live. And it's the only permitted smelter in North America. So, uh, you know, you know how long it takes to get a permit. This is your cobalt smelter in the town of Cobalt, um, aptly named. North of that is graphite in Hearst. To the northwest is lithium in the Thunder Bay and uh, further uh, Red Lake area. But you know, the, the, the best news, of course, is Sudbury, Ontario, just uh, a few miles from where I live, uh, where 40% of the nickel is coming from. This is your class one nickel that's needed in creating batteries. We are, for the first time, going to bring all of Ontario. If you look at a map and you see northern Ontario is 880,000 square miles. It takes me 18 hours to drive to Thunder Bay. This is big. This is Texas big, uh, when you think about it. <laughs> right? Uh, we're now bringing all of those minerals from the north available within North America as we develop precursor for electric batteries. Uh, we build the cathodes. We build electric batteries in Ontario. We hope to, I made an announcement in Windsor, Ontario yesterday of uh, Flexing Gate's first uh, uh, um, battery lab. So this is real. This is not, we're thinking of this, this is real time happening right now, Glenn. Fantastic. I, I can't tell you, you know, Chelsea, Holly, this is something we should be talking about. Uh, um, I, 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 let's take this offline and have a discussion because what the minister just said there is a point of differentiation that actually enables what Brian is doing down here in Arizona. So with that, Minister, thank you very, very much for, for your comments on that. What I'd like to do now to speed things along is I'm not going to give bios on people. Uh, we have three very wonderful people here. We've got David, Brian, and Matt. And I, what I would like to do, Matt, uh, is to pick up on the minister uh, who gave you a great plug for everything you're doing and let you sort of introduce who you are and what you're doing and what's going on in your neighborhood. Thank you, Glenn. You know, first of all, I want to say uh, uh, thank you for having me here. And the second thing is, is thank you to the minister because he nailed it. Um, and, and you know, the, the cool thing is that uh, uh, chips are cool again. And, you know, I've been in the semiconductor industry for over 20 years, um, working at ATI and AMD before I came to Venture Lab for about uh, 17 years. And I ran the global $1 billion graphics chip business from, uh, from Markham in New York region. And, uh, 
And so I've lived and breathed semiconductors for uh, most of my career. And it's great to hear the understanding of the importance of this foundational technology um, everywhere now. And, and three years ago, people weren't talking about chips and, and they are now. So I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, I, I came to Venture Lab uh, about three years ago and Venture Lab is, is the founder community. As the minister said, we're, we're a regional innovation center in York region, just north of Toronto. Um, you know, we've created over 4,500 jobs, raised over 200 million investment capital for the startups that we work with. And we saw a gap in the ecosystem because hardware and semiconductor companies have a longer journey to market. It takes, you know, more than two years to bring a chip to market and there's major barriers. And those barriers are things like access to test equipment, um, very expensive test equipment, uh, test so uh, design software. And so we've uh, created uh, partnerships with companies like AMD, Synopsys. Um, design software for Synopsys uh, costs $750,000 to a million dollars per seat. And they are uh, giving that to our uh, participants in the Hardware Catalyst Initiative. So we're moving a huge barrier. We have a 3,000 square foot lab um, that allows these companies to test uh, their products um, and they don't need this test equipment every day but it's there when they need it and they can take that money that they would spend on uh, buying that equipment and spend it on R&D and engineers um, and so the the other piece and the minister uh, talked about this also is capital and uh, it's harder for hardware companies and semiconductor companies to get capital and so we have a capital uh, investment program raised over hundred million dollars last year uh, for for companies, and we need to remove that uh, that barrier um, also. Um, uh, the Venture Lab is also a founding member of the uh, founding ecosystem member for the Canada Semiconductor Council, and you know we believe that we need to foster an ecosystem, an ecosystem that uh, capitalizes on the talent in the region. There is a ton of talent in York Region and in Ontario, and that, that talent has actually gone um, global, gone worldwide. We want to retain that talent. We want to leverage that talent um, in semiconductors uh, in the province of Ontario. Um, we have great universities uh, in the region, um, in Ontario, like uh, York University, U of T, Waterloo, that, that uh, pumps out great talent. And then we have this, the, we want to, foster this ecosystem of large companies, medium-sized companies and startups. And because when you do that, you have this ecosystem of talent and engineers graduate from say Waterloo, they work at AMD and they really learn there how to practically design chips. And then they go off and start their own startups. Um, and so we, we believe that uh, what we're doing through the Harder Catalyst Initiative is is helping helping these startups uh, create, um, uh, commercialize, create commercialized uh, file IP and go global. And that's that's what's really important. And we also believe that um, as part of that in, in the long term, that there's got to be um, supply chain elements to this. And uh, we see that absolutely, uh, absolutely happening in the future. Thank you very much, Matt. You know, it's interesting uh, to, to try and put together. I think your industry started about 42 years ago, if I remember correctly. It's somewhere in that that range. And it is now 225 percent of the digital economy uh, of the of the global economy is digital so i mean th this is an unbelievable short short period of time so what i'd like to do is move over to to david and have david give some opening comments and some thoughts as to what we're talking about thank you very much Glenn, for the introduction and, and minister it's an honor to meet you sir and thank you for what you're doing for the province of ontario and uh, the hosts thank you again for inviting me to this panel i really appreciate it so i'm david buckley i work with the san Mina corporation it's a headquartered out of uh, san jose we're about a seven billion dollar corporation with businesses across the world with a heavy concentration in north america spanning east west coast and up here in canada we have the design center of excellence involved in enabling semiconductor technologies and what i mean by this is taking the products the wafers the dye uh, ultimately those things can't be used unless they're packaged so our expertise is in packaging the products that are coming out of these semiconductor businesses into some very very complex uh, device structures and componentry that are used to make the systems and these systems fuel the internet the data centers the cloud uh, they're involved in automotive lidar they're invo involved in optical and um, quantum uh, computing uh, they're involved in medical sensing devices so the technology enablement that we create 
is around the semiconductor business, getting it into devices that fundamentally go into structures and systems. We based the center of the design is here in Ottawa. Uh, we have a, a base down in Carlton in Dallas and a number of design centers spread through Huntsville and San Jose as well. And we're really focused on the uh, elements of photonics, high-speed RF and microelectronics packaging that enable the, some of the large businesses you talk about, the, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, the Siemens, whoever, in being able to make systems. And that's our mandate. We take these technologies and we enable them in practice. Thank you, David, very, very much. Um, Brian, I'm thrilled to see you. Thank you very much for, for jumping on and giving us a hand and giving us the state of Arizona's position on what's going on here. Likewise, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and great to see you again, Glenn. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you for so many years. Um, I have heard so much already that I'm very, very excited about. So I um, appreciate all the comments from the minister and, and just couldn't be more pleased to be here. Uh, Brian Sherman, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at the Arizona Commerce Authority. I'm responsible for teams and programs and initiatives that are focused on emerging industries and then um, transformation that's uh, happening within established industries. And uh, semiconductor is uh, certainly one of those. Yes, um, chips are, are back, but um, I, I love David's comments. Uh, packaging is now really sexy. And so we're really excited to see uh, where that takes the industry. Um, just a little bit of uh, background on some of the things that we're working on. I was, I've been an economic developer for a long time now, and we've really had to raise our game. Um, this is one industry that's really pushing us to um, raise our capabilities and understanding, um, you know, deep in industry. So truly systemic thinking. Um, in the past, it really was enough to compete by, um, I, I don't want to dismiss it as being transactional, but classic economic development where, you know, we're competing for a project and then we figure out how to get that capital investment to come out of the ground. Um, that's, that's not enough anymore. Um, we are talking about capital investments and transformation that's happening so quickly and is so profound that it requires real systemic thinking uh, to be successful. So it, in the semiconductor industry, we're very fortunate. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of uh, you know, all these capital investment announcements that, that we look forward to seeing come out of the ground in the years ahead, uh, specifically TSMC and Intel. We're proud to have most of the major global semiconductor companies have a presence in Arizona and have for a long time. We're really proud of that. There's so much growth on the production side. We're also very excited about what's happening at the national level. We'd like to see it move faster. Um, Glenn, you referenced um, movement in uh, the EU that's really exciting. Um, a couple of months ago, we, we saw Japan uh, take the, the CHIPS Act playbook and that's implement cool. Uh, they, they've, they've already implemented the equivalent of what we're proposing is the National Semiconductor Technology Center. So it's out of the ground and it's all the same companies. Um, so congratulations to Japan. We need to move faster in the United States. So um, we are focused on uh, my colleagues uh, that, that focus on uh, the classic economic development are working on corporate attraction and corporate expansion. Are, we've never seen anything like this in our pipeline. I focus on very strategic work and we've decided that in order to help our uh, clients and existing companies be successful, in addition to that, to help what uh, we anticipate is gonna flow at the national level, any of the same companies, we need to focus in a few areas, starting with workforce. Every single one of our clients, that is their paramount concern that we can develop a pipeline of talent um, that will, that's sufficient, not, not, you know, not to mention that will um, support the innovation that, that we're all hoping to see. Um, so workforce, talent. Uh, secondly, supply chain. Um, we, we'll talk a lot more about that, I think, in the, the, uh, the little bit of time we have left. Uh, infrastructure. And by that, I mean power and water and also research infrastructure. Absolutely critical. Um, looking forward to developing partnerships with some of uh, some new colleagues that I've just met today. Um, we can really compete across North America um, when when we look at a, you know a, the, the entire ecosystem that's required in semiconductor and all the you know customers and users the the whole ecosystem. 
Um, and then uh, lastly, entrepreneurism. Um, I can't wait to hear more from Matt uh, about Venture Labs. Um, that I would say, um, admittedly, is our biggest gap in Arizona. We have been very strong in production for a long time. That's only gonna grow. We also have a very robust uh, startup ecosystem. Um, and the ACA has been an instrumental part in helping that grow in the last 10 years. Um, I would say there's an industry-wide gap in terms of the corporate connections to the tech startup ecosystem. There is not enough attention of founders and investors in the entire startup ecosystem on, on building that bridge and making that connection to just generally hard tech. Um, so I uh, want to hear a lot more about Venture Labs and, and uh, talk about how we can uh, maybe, maybe uh, replicate some of what you're doing, but certainly partner with you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, let me move back to David, because I know you've got a hard stop coming up here pretty soon. So one of my questions, David, is, you know, how can the Arizona-Ontario uh, partnership support the growth that Brian just talked about? So I, I think he touched on a number of things um, uh, in terms of like education and um, uh, like institutions, if you like, that, that advance the, the the science as well as the uh, the practicality to getting things to market. I, I think there's a lot of focus um, within the industry on your know, the silicon side of things, but, and just the silicon side of things. But we should recognise that the way for industry, so so some of this data centre and um, automotive is photonics related, which is a slight different twist to this, very subtle. But in the automotive industries, the five G industries, the communications and data centre industries, we actually have to look at it a little bit more broadly and make sure we're addressing all of these pipelines and streams that address the diversity of what is a semiconductor or wafer ecosystem. Um, there's, as I said, there's a lot of focus on some of the learning around devices. I think we have to now take that and apply it more broadly through, through the academic institutions, but also the applied sciences. So how we actually make these things. So we are heavily focused upon getting things to market and being really efficient for our customers. It was mentioned earlier on about the, the velocity and the pace of churn is really fast. We have to be so nimble to do these things and so adept at adopting some fairly innovative new processes to get products into the market that allow these things to be enabled. 5G, LiDAR, you know, the automotive industry, medical environment. We have to be quick at doing this. That's, that's what we have to be good at. And so the collaboration between Arizona and Ontario has to decide, define, I believe, has to define a framework where it's understood what we bring to the party. And it's understood where those centers of excellence are. And it's understood how we can leverage those and even direct them because we are very attached to the industry and its, and its forward thinking. And, and that's the route to revenue. And being part of industry, that cash flow is our lifeblood. And so we want to make sure that is nimble, agile, and really focused where we need it to be. Thank you very much, David. So Matt, question, how do we put a deal together with Brian endorsed by the minister and we get the governor involved and how do we show the world that Arizona, Mexico, and Ontario are deadly serious about Project North America here? Well, to address Brian's point, partnerships are key. And um, we have been fortunate to form partnerships with, you know, large industry players like Dell, Arm, AMD, TSMC, Synopsys, Siemens. Uh, we've also formed partnership with Silicon Catalyst, which is uh, a uh, uh, incubator in, uh, in the Valley. And we're, we're actually co-incubating some companies. Um, we believe that that partnerships um, are, are the key to this, and would be you know happy to to work with uh, Arizona and and partner in that way. Because um, if you look at the resources that these partners have brought to the table, and that's in things like uh, software uh, expertise, donated equipment. Um, and tons of things to enable uh, to them as partners that totals over the life of this program more than 50 million dollars um, that these partners have uh, have contributed so um, absolutely we, we believe in partnerships and uh, as I said we've already started some in in, in the valley and and happy to uh, happy to do that uh, going forward um, and, and leveraging this so that we can take these Canadian companies and take them uh, take them global Super. Now, I'm going to, Minister, I'm going to put you on the spot for two seconds. I know it's a, it's a touchy subject, the EV uh, business going back and forth between the states. One can only hope the professional, uh, professionals at your level sort that one out and get us all squared away. Arizona has a very, very robust automotive relationship with uh, Mexico. Very robust, specifically Sonora. 
And this EV side of Arizona is linking Sonora in a big way with Brian's shop and what we're doing here. I'm, I'm hopeful that some thoughts, you might have some thoughts on above and beyond the political side of that, but how do we then take the, e, the EV industry in Canada that already is moving down here on their own and embrace this at a political level so that we, we show this kumbaya in North America that you know, as a byproduct of the semiconductor industry, this is one of the big applications. Well, uh, that's a great question, Glenn. So I have here in my hand a letter I wrote to your governor, Ducey, uh, just uh, January 24th, trying to give an idea that uh, 10 million Americans wake up every single morning just to make products to ship to Canada. Um, you know, I could break it down by state as well. And it's, it's a fascinating discussion that I alluded to earlier since the auto pack in 1965, that we are so linked, you know, a part that is made in Ontario that crosses the border, that is made into a bigger widget that comes back to Ontario, that's made into a motor or an engine that crosses the border, that's put into a tractor, that's shipped across to Saskatchewan to harvest uh, wheat and uh, oats that are then shipped to the United States to make cereal, which is shipped back to Canada for us to buy. I mean, that is how inextricably we are linked. So yep. when we start talking about this beautiful NAFTA 2.0 deal that we just signed and having this uh, battery EV um, jurisdictional uh, carve out uh, is very harmful. Uh, I have heard our prime minister directly on a call saying this will not happen. I mean, when you think about Arizona alone, it's 100 million in uh, uh, transport equipment that Ontario alone buys, 14% of, uh, uh, the, uh, of the share of imports, you know, almost 100 million in lettuce and uh, chicory and other things like that. You know, there are, sadly, the Canadians will demand retaliation if the Americans do this. I'm not saying I am in favor of it. I'm just saying Canadians are gonna demand that. Um, we have been working in harmony for decades on autos and many, many other products. Uh, we need to continue that. My three page letter to the governor talked about uh, how our two supply chains are so linked. Uh, so we need uh, to do everything we can to keep the temperature on this down um, so we cannot have an exclusion of Ontario made products in a North American free trade deal. It is only going to lead to a very, very uh, uh, decisive and divisive uh, path. That's, um, and, and just so you're aware in my capacity as a diplomat for Canada, I delivered uh, the deputy minister, the deputy prime minister's letter to the governor as well. And so uh, the good news is, as Brian can probably attest is, uh, Arizona is very much interested in making this work. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you want to add two cents onto that. Yeah, I, I would add to it. One of the ways that um, we can undermine efforts like this, um, the exclusionary practices, is to get even um, tighter in terms of how we collaborate on innovation. You know, a lot of these debates revolve around finished goods. And we can undermine that, uh, you know, we can mitigate that. It's probably a better way to describe it by um, continuing to build collaboration on innovation. So all the focus areas that you mentioned, Minister, um, you know, working with us, um, our, our growing automotive industry here, um, the Institute for Automated Mobility. I mean, we're certainly very forward looking in terms of autonomy and connected vehicles. All those kind of things can make that tie much stronger. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I I just want to throw this over to Comse. Uh, Victor, you're being, very, you're being very patient and listening to all of this. Um, how do you think we can help enable and engage more with Mexico on this? Well, thank you, Glenn. All the issues that we have touched on are of interest to Mexico, of course. But I think the best way to move forward is to identify the points in which we can start now and identify the parts in which each party of Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. can take the lead in their competitive advantages. So one issue that I was in Washington, D.C. last weekend, 
talking with Mexican and, and U.S. officials on this semiconductor uh, supply chain uh, uh, issue that is important for the both countries. And I was surprised to hear that Mexico still not has identified an area in which they can participate in fully. And that is where us in the private sector come in and say, well, we can participate in the transformation of raw materials. For example, Mexico has large ab abundance of silica sand, and we have a lot of water in the south of our country. And that only provides the opportunity for us to transform that silica sand into crystals and ingots uh, to then export to somewhere like Arizona, where they could be uh, assembled into their final delivery piece. The second issue is talent development. Of course, we have Canada with, with uh, the, the Venture Lab uh, concept in Arizona with great universities, but also Mexico has tremendous universities with a lot of technical skills and at a cheaper rate. And so there are areas in which we can collaborate to find synergies through which we can move more of that R&D that happens maybe elsewhere outside of North America to our, our region and help those students, engineers, technical uh, leaders in these universities to also develop the supply chain manufacturing capabilities that, that we are talking about uh, today. And finally, the institutions are in place already. Not just are we talking about it here with our state or provincial governments, but the federal governments have already established their working groups to talk about these issues precisely. So it is our duty to also bring the ideas that we generate here to our federal officials because those working groups are ongoing through two institutional levels, which is the high level economic dialogue between the US and Mexico and the North American Leader Summit. And without us being able to communicate these ideas to them, then our ideas will simply be ideas and will never have the impact that we wish them to have. Thank you very much, Victor. Holly, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, we do. And uh, thankfully we've covered quite a few of them already, but <clears throat> before we wrap this up, we do have a question from uh, uh, one of our CBC members, Scott Schlund from Stantec, who everyone will certainly worldwide, but especially in Canada knows uh, Stantec very well. And he's wondering how North America's energy portfolio needs to grow to accommodate an increase in chip production. And Glenn, I'm sure you can speak to that, you know, from a number of different points, you know, with your role with EPCOR as well. Uh, Scott, water is not going to be an issue. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's start with that one. And I can tell you that in Canada, power is not an issue. Minister? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to weigh in on that for a second, if you don't mind. Um, we have just uh, looked at um, a new study on new water power sources throughout um, throughout Ontario. When I was energy critic some years ago, quite a few years ago in Ontario, uh, we were talking about 2,200, 2,200 available uh, uh, sites for water power. About 700 were extremely practical. Uh, but you think about Ontario, we're at 94% uh, clean energy. So when we talk about making products, uh, making batteries, uh, we're talking about using uh, clean energy to make our products. There's an abundance of water here as well, an abundance of minerals, um, and, an, and quite frankly, an abundance of power. In fact, we're at a point still in Ontario we, where we make more power every day than we can consume. And so we uh, still are in a habit of paying the U.S. and uh, others to take our surplus power that'll change slowly as we continue to grow uh, but there is certainly power is not the issue and you know we uh, as a canadian company epcor is the uh, the facilitating reason that samsung was capable to move their plant into texas we were doing the water for them Brian, uh, a comment on water and energy for Arizona? Well, uh, I mean, it's 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 critical. So, you know, we we clearly have a different uh, of water uh, uh, challenges and opportunities in Arizona. We're also very confident that um, supply will be there. The semiconductor industry is, uh, you know, arguably the best uh, corporate steward uh, in its usage of water, and there's a lot of innovation going on there. Um, you know, look no further than what not not uh, pointing any fingers, but look no further than what happened last winter in Texas. Um, 
uh, in terms of power. Um, our turn is coming if we don't address our infrastructure. So it's really about resiliency and reliable power and growing it um, to keep step with industry needs. Um, all solvable challenges, but ha we've got to uh, give it our attention. So Glenn, I apologize. Uh, I apologize, but my team has told me that I have a uh, meeting uh, that started at 12 o'clock that I got to scoot out for. Well, thank uh, you very much, Minister, for being here. I, I, I'm embarrassed to leave because I'm going to drop a little bomb before I leave. We haven't even <laughs> talked about we haven't even talked about gallium nitride yet. So <laughs> that's a whole uh, other discussion on a different style of, of, uh, of uh, chip, but we'll do well, that again. We'll let Chelsea pick up the ball with us here locally and make Sorry, sure. Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister. All. Best of success, continued success to everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. We Thank need you. you all to be strong. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Fidelli. Uh, we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. I just want to throw out one more last question. Um, what is, and Victor, if you want to address this one, what do you see as Mexico's role in the future of the North American semiconductor industry? Thank you, Holly. And, and to touch on the last question, right now, Mexico is also going through a very important energy debate in our country. We're going through a, a reform in the electricity sector that will have monumental impacts on how energy is generated and distributed in the country. Uh, our, uh, right now, we have private and public generators, uh, and the reform would give more power to the public uh, company, which is the Federal Electricity Commission. Um, and, and that creates a lot of questions as to the future cost of energy or electricity in, in Mexico. So that is something that uh, I encourage our partners in Canada and in the US to keep a close eye on. Uh, and if you have any questions to please reach out to us. It's a complex debate that is ongoing, but will have a tremendous impact on investments coming into the country. The, 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 um, the question as to what is Mexico's role, I think is, is very uh, complex, but simple at the same time. Complex because we have to develop a, a vast and robust supply chain that is with a lot of new ideas that the, both the White House and Canada have outlined as priorities, which are among many other issues, electric vehicle manufacturing, critical mineral uh, production and security, large capacity batteries uh, uh, production and semiconductor uh, production. Right now, we are very uh, uh, virgin in these, in these areas of manufacturing because they're relatively new. Semiconductor, semiconductor production, for example, that is not an industry that is well known in Mexico. So there would be a learning curve to get into, into that. Uh, semiconductor uh, supply chains have long been dependent on China. And so as we're seeing this geopolitical trend and decreasing our reliance uh, in, with China, either through a US-China uh, tariff war, but also the COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused companies to regionalize their supply chains, Canada, or Canada and the United States are going to automatically look south to Mexico as their uh, logical substitute to China and to Asian manufacturing capabilities. And so the, the, the role of Mexico is going to be precisely that. Let's substitute that reliance that uh, North America has, has had on China to then develop these new industries in Mexico. And Mexico is such a large country with a lot to offer in different areas that each state, each city is also going to be key for, for the interests of US uh, and Canadian businesses. The state of Sonora, which is right south of Arizona, is going to play a very important role in this because it is the number one mining state in the country. And so automatically, we're going to have a lot of collaboration between Sonora and both Canada and the US. But we're also going to be looking south to the states of Veracruz, Chiapas, Campeche, Yucatan, Quintana Roo, Oaxaca, uh, among others, because in that area of the country, we have a large abundance of water and both the White House and Mexico have identified uh, that region as a priority to develop, to re reduce migration flows and to improve security. And so as we're seeing these political uh, priorities play out, they're certainly going to have an impact as to where companies are going to be located in the near future. Victor, muchas gracias. Thank you very, very much for, for representing Mexico on this call. Very, very helpful. Great insight. 
and it shows the uh, the alliance that Arizona has with your wonderful country. Uh, Brian, thank you as well for, for stepping in, and Matt and David. Holly, I'll let you close this out. Yes, and Victor, we do have someone who just asked for your email address in the chat. If you could, oh, you're on top of it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Holly. Thank you. Thank Glenn. you, everyone, so much. Uh, Glenn, we appreciate you moderating. As always, your your knowledge on on everything is is always uh, it's it's to an incredible depth and and always surprising. Uh, how much you know about uh, the topics that we cover. We appreciate you and your running the, the CABC and, and everything that you do for the state of Arizona and, and for the USMCA. We have a couple questions that we weren't able to get to, but please email me directly. I have put my email address in the chat as well. If you want to reach any of the speakers, you can uh, reach out to me for that as well. Brian, Matt, David, thank you so much, Victor, for uh, representing uh, the country of Mexico and everyone with Ontario and the minister's office uh, who made this event possible. This is our, our second year doing this and uh, we just could not be more pleased. So thank you again, and we hope to see you all again soon. Take care.